All right, I think we might actually be working this time. Let's see. All right, I think we're actually working. Can you see this, Peter, and get in here? Got two people in here. Welcome, welcome. We're going to be doing a Facebook Live here. Passive Income MD and I. Let's see if we can get him in here. Adjust the camera a bit. Send him a quick tip. All right. Let's see if I can invite him on in here. Did we just crash? Oh, here we go. Trying to search through this huge group for Peter. That's maybe not the best idea. It's a little bit big. It takes forever to search it. Yeah, this is live. Sorry, guys. We're just trying to get uh, Peter in here. Let me invite him into the group. Ah, there it is. There's the problem. I wasn't allowing him to invite. Now you should be able to get in. There you go, Peter. Now we got you. All right. With Passive Income MD. Sorry about the slow start here, guys. We've actually been having trouble with Facebook Live all day. I thought it was our problem for about a half hour until we realized... It was actually Facebook's problem. So there are all kinds of issues today with Facebook and Instagram. Just wasn't working out very well today, but apparently it's yeah, up it's now. Can you hear me, Peter? Okay. All right. How's my sound uh, for you? It's good? Awesome. Good. All right. Let's that only this. took us like... Uh, yeah, that only took us like what, um, ten hours to make this happen? Yeah, yeah, not bad. Six tries, something like that. <laughs> anyway, okay. what we're doing tonight, folks? If you're tuning in here, I see there's 37 of you here. How you doing? Uh, we're going to be doing uh, something pretty exciting. We're going to be doing some education on real estate. Specifically, we're going to be talking about IRR and equity multiple and also cash on cash return and which of these you should care about so on and so forth the other thing we're going to be talking about is a little bit about peter's new online course he's put together this is the first online course for passive income md and we're really excited about it it's all about syndications if you've thought about investing in real estate syndications or private real estate funds but you just didn't feel like you knew enough to get started that's who this course is for. It's designed for you to help learn uh, this stuff and to know how to spot a good deal and tell it apart from a bad deal and to find what, what you should be interested in. So uh, let's start with the educational piece, shall we, Peter? You want to talk a little bit about, uh, about um, you know, what returns really matter in real estate and which ones are best to pay attention to? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we get... I mean, I've seen it here on this group and in, in my group as well, Passive Income Docs. I've seen people kind of take a little snippet that they see either from a syndication, maybe they go on a crowdfunding site, they see a few of these metrics and they post it there and they say, can someone explain this to me? And that happens all the time. And so I usually, usually it consists of a couple of different things and a couple of different metrics. So I figured it might be worthwhile just to talk about three of them three of the most important ones that you'll see in that little box under each little deal, and then kind of explain why you might care about all three of those things. And so I want to start with the first one. It's called cash on cash return. Now, as you guys might know, if you read any of my stuff, one of my favorite two words is cash and flow. So cash flow and, and this cash on cash return, the idea is that it really helps you determine what your cash flow is going to be on a yearly basis in terms of return. Now, what it is, is you take your yearly cash flow and it's divided by the total initial investment that you put in. And that kind of tells you like an annual yield. 
And for someone like me who actually cares about this cash flow, because I live off some of this cash flow, it matters to me. You know, I have to know that, for example, if I'm going to put in $25,000 into a deal, I want to know on a year to year basis uh, around how much I should expect in terms of cash that comes back to me. So that's cash on cash. You'll see that typically anywhere from uh, these deals, a lot of times between eight to 10%. And again, it's just the amount of cash flow that you get per year over the, over the initial investment that you made. And hopefully that's pretty clear. That's called cash on cash return. The second metric that you might see is something called an IRR. This one is the one that took me a while to figure out. Um, it's called internal rate of return. And the reason this thing exists is that, you know, for most of these type of deals and a lot of other types of investments, it's not like you get a simple return at all these fair, like just really equal and um, consistent intervals, right? I mean, some of these, for some of these deals, you might not see a return for six months while they're rehabbing the properties. Then all of a sudden you get a little bit of a cash bolus there to, to have a catch up. And then sometimes there might be a refinance. You might start to get a lot of your capital back. And then you might start getting into that little bit of cash flow per month or per quarter. And then at the end of the deal, you often, you know, once they sell the property, you get a good amount of your cash back. And so this whole metric called IRR, a lot of people really confuse that for just like an annual return. And a lot of times people confuse that for a cash on cash return, right? But the thing to understand is that what it is, it's a return that really tries to take into account the time value of money. Now, what I mean by that is that, you know, if you have a dollar that gets returned to you today versus a dollar that gets returned to you five years from now, I mean, those two things are worth different things, right? Um, the reason being is that dollar today uh, is automatically more valuable than a dollar in five years because, you know, just erosion due to inflation. That's number one. And number two, opportunity costs. I mean, if you get the dollar back today, you could probably put it somewhere. I mean, it's only a dollar, but let's just talk in bigger numbers, $10,000 or, or whatever. You're able to put that and maybe get interest on that. And you're able to put that to use versus that, you know, you receiving that, that money down the line. And so IRR, this metric really tries to take into account not only what overall returns you get, but when you get those returns. And you guys might see my, <laughs> okay, sorry. I thought my wife was coming in here. But- uh, She's gonna yeah. find out you're on it's Facebook gonna... Live talking about yeah, it. Yeah, it's gonna be, I mean, I'm worried because my kids are, are trying to go to bed right now. And it's gonna be one of those CNN situations where like <laughs> those kids come running in. Um, what, what, group anyway, members, so IR... what group members might not know right now is that it's Peter's wife's birthday. So he's hiding in this room uh, talking with us. So he's going to get in <laughs> trouble here in a few minutes. So we got to make sure we get no, this no, no. across. I've got a nice, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a nice dinner. I've got a nice dinner plan for her. We have a small little window of time. And so uh, <laughs> why not? Perfect. This is the perfect time to take care of this. Yeah. But um, again, IRR really kind of tries to smooth out those returns for you and allow you to figure out, all right, how is this return going to be on a year-to-year -year basis, even though I get returns at weird intervals? And it allows you to really compare, let's say, I don't know, apples to apples. You're able to compare one investment to another, you know, depending on the way they get those returns. And so IRR is out there. Is that, is that clear, Jim? Yeah, I think so. What people need to realize is, is IRR is actually what I'm most familiar with. This is the internal rate of return. And this is how stocks and mutual funds and bonds, this is how they report the returns. It's an IRR, right? So if you're used to seeing these annualized returns for your mutual fund, that's an IRR return. And the reason why you have to pay attention to an IRR return is that it accounts for the cash flows, the money coming into the investment and the money going out of the investment. If there was no money coming in or going out, all you gotta do is see what it's worth at the end of the year versus what it's worth at the beginning of the year. And it's easy to calculate the return. But once you got money yeah. coming in and out every month, then it's harder to calculate. And that's why you got to use this, this fancy calculation. Essentially, you're a spreadsheet or a calculator does it. You put in all the yeah. values and inflows and outflows, and it spits out what your return is. So I like to think yeah, IRR absolutely. is the basic return. I think the other two are more exotic returns, but real estate <laughs> investors tend to be a little bit uh, more familiar with the cash on cash return and the equity multiple. Yeah. And the last one, like you mentioned, is the equity multiple. And you might see that. I mean, there's a famous, there's a crowdfunding company. I think you're one of the affiliates for it as well, too. But there's a crowdfunding company called equity multiple. But what that metric means is that it really accounts for the total return that you get over the life of the investment. For example, it's um, let's say you put in a $10,000 investment 
And over the lifetime of the investment, if you add up all the dividends and then you add up the like, capital return at the end, then you end up at 20,000. You put in 10,000 and then you end up with 20,000 all cumulative. Well, you take that number 20,000 over your initial investment and that is 20,000 over 10,000, that's two. So that's that number that you might see called equity multiple and how they calculate that. And it's good because it, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of this investment, you know that your $10,000 is going to basically become twenty thousand dollars, and that's some people really care about that, right? Because that's the growth in your your net worth, and, and it matters. The thing is, it doesn't really take into account the time it takes to get there. I mean, it could be a equity multiple for you know of two, but it might have taken you three years, but it might have taken you five or ten. So those are the things that you really have to pay attention to when you see equity multiple. Some people get really excited because they see an equity multiple of two point five versus two point two for this other deal. But you have to account for that time. And that's why you start looking at metrics like IRR. And then you start looking at metrics like cash on cash return. And so I always tell people, all right, it kind of depends on what your priorities are. I mean, it's, let's be honest. It's nice if all three of those things are extremely high, right, for each deal. But to be honest, when you're comparing different deals, you're going to see that maybe one is a little bit higher for one deal, like an IRR. Maybe another deal, equity multiple, will be a little bit higher. And then for – so it matters. For example – People who are really focused on IRR, I tend to find are the, really the, the yield focused people. Like I want my money working as hard as possible at our, all times. I want that IRR to be 15% regardless of whatever, you know, uh, and that's the number that I focus on. And again, for people that are looking for more of the overall net worth gain, for example, I mean, they might care about that equity multiple, that it's going to be a two, you know, in three years or five, and you're going to double your money. So I mean, those are some of the major metrics that you look at. And again, it took me a while to figure that out. I mean, it's funny. It seems so simple, I guess, at times when I talk about it and when I talk to people about it. And when you see those numbers on the top of deals, like, honestly, it took me a while to figure that out. And, you know, I get that kind of co complaint or that issue a lot. People have, uh, you know, they see these things and they're common. They don't know how to evaluate these type of deals. And that's ultimately why we ended up actually creating this course, Jim. And it's not even something that I initially went into this thing to even create. But so many people were asking about it that I found myself saying the same thing. I mean, you probably, this is probably why you wrote your book and probably why you actually, why you even have your blog. Yeah, but people were sure. saying, asking me the same questions over and over and over again. And so I decided to kind of just package it in, you know, package it into one, one concise resource so that people don't have to go looking all over the place for this sort of thing. Yeah. So for those who are just tuning in now, we're talking with Peter Kim. He's the, the genius behind Passive Income MD. We're talking a little bit tonight about his new online course that you can sign up for through July 9th. The link for that I put in the comments on this post. Uh, the link is uh, whitecoatinvestor.com slash syndication, just so it's easy to remember. I put that, that link together for you. And if you buy, buy the course through that link, I'm going to give you a signed copy of my financial boot camp book as well. So that's the benefit of going through my affiliate link there. And of course, if you buy through that link, it's an affiliate link. I get paid, right? But we're also trying to answer your questions about real estate investing and particularly these accredited investor kind of investments, these syndications, these real estate funds. And I see a couple of questions here that have come in. I don't know if you can see these or not, Peter, but the first one comes from James Wax. Uh, actually, I think both of them do. Uh, he asks, do you have any thoughts on using syndication funds as opposed to choosing investments. So it's basically the funds versus picking the investments yourself with the syndicator. Which one do you prefer, Peter? Uh, syndication funds as opposed to choosing the individual. Yeah, there's pros and cons to both. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, there's pros and cons to both. Hold on for one second. I think she's going to ultimately get ready here. I don't want to put on a little show here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I actually like to invest in both. I mean, there's there's benefits of actually going to, I mean, if I have the question right, doing an individual syndication, the, the positive and the pro to that is that you know the exact property that you're investing in. I mean, you can vet that property. You can take a look at it. You know that an individual sponsor. And for example, my first deal, I mean, I was, I don't know, I guess I was a little bit timid going into my first syndication deal. I, you know, I saw deals and I kind of let them pass. I let them pass. And then there was one deal, syndication, that was actually about three to four minutes away from my house. It's from my house. Did I lose you, Peter? Yeah, Are you still there? There you go. Still there. Can you see me? 
Yeah, you just dropped out for about 30 seconds. I don't know if it was my yeah. connection or yours, but. Yeah, no worries. But it was uh, about three to four minutes from my house. And it's nice because I got to look at it. I knew that exact property. I knew the market. I knew that area. And I, that knowing that knowing that exact kind of the details of that property allowed me to actually, you know, take that next step and invest. Now, the problem with syndication funds, and the thing is, like, it's kind of like a blind investment. You are trusting the sponsor to choose all those things for you. So, but it provides diversification like you don't have in that syndication. So I honestly do both. And it kind of depends. Like if I know that property, you know, I know that sponsor and there's a great option there. Sometimes the returns are a little bit better on these individual syndication deals versus on the funds overall. But um, I'll, I'll go into both depending on what I'm looking for. Yeah, I've also invested in both. Uh, shoot, I don't know, maybe a dozen syndications at this point. Some have gone round trip, some have not yet. Um, I'll tell you what, though, I don't feel like I'm particularly talented at choosing the deals. And so one benefit for me of the fund is I get a professional to choose the deals. You know, they go out and pick the properties. And if you're really worried that they're going to pick a bunch of losers, one thing you can do is you can get into the fund late. You know, a lot of these funds have a two or three year ramp up period where they're buying the investments. And you can actually get your money in there after a couple of years when you see what three quarters of the investments in the fund they're going to be. So you know about how they're going to perform at that point. Now, obviously, you miss out on those investments, uh, you know, the returns from the first couple of years of the fund when you buy in late, but it's not quite as blind. So if you're worrying about buying stuff blind, then just don't be the first person into the fund. You know, you can get into it after a year and a half or two years, et cetera. So for those just tuning in, we're here with Peter Kim. He's talking about his new course. Uh, let's talk just for a minute about this course, Peter. What is in the course? I mean, how long is it? Is it video? <laughs> I mean, how long does it take to take this course? Um, you know, give us the, the nuts and bolts behind the course here. Yeah, absolutely. The course for those who haven't actually heard anything about it, it's called Passive Income by Investing in Syndications. And really the goal of this course is to take you to place from, take you from a place of zero to little knowledge on the concept of investing in syndications to just a place of confidence of knowing what you're investing in, why you're investing in, and what might be a good deal and what might not be, what might, what might be a bad deal actually. And the goal is to have you in that place in four weeks. Uh, we've kind of, this, we've kind of created four modules, you know, on different topics. Um, the first module is really about kind of understanding the, con you know, the reasons why you might invest in syndications, talk about investing in real estate, talk about some of the pros and cons. Uh, actually th talks a little bit about kind of the mindset of an investor, you know, what your goals are, helping us help you set your goals to understand, you know, there should be a reason why you're investing in these type of things or any sort of investment. It's not just to make more money, but maybe you need the end goal in mind and make sure this fits with you. Uh, that's number one. Module two, we're going to start going into the sponsors. And like you mentioned, a lot of times that's the most important part. I mean, trusting who you're going to be actually investing with. I mean, that's the hardest thing. And actually, it's the most important thing because they're the professionals. They're going to be the ones managing the property, operating the property. And so you've got to ultimately know who you're investing with and knowing, the, you know, know the right questions to ask, know what to look for. What are the metrics involved with that? The number, the, um, the next section is all about the money involved. I mean, the fees, the returns, you know, things like we talked about already on this, uh, on this little Facebook live cash on cash, IRR. There's a whole bunch of other metrics that you kind of need to know when you start looking at this thing. So we go over and kind of take a deep dive into those numbers to make sure you understand all of that. And then the last module is talking about the property itself and the market it's in to know when you look at one of these offerings and they kind of give you all these pretty pictures about the property and what they're planning to do. And then also talk about the area and how amazing it is. You know, we're able to kind of give you some, some ways to kind of actually verify that these things are actually true in a nice, easy way. And so hopefully, and that's going to be dripped out over four weeks, each of those modules. And not only with those modules, we didn't want to just give you content, but we wanted to give you a community to actually, to help kind of really nail down this information and make sure you understand. So we're going to be having, we have a private Facebook group that we set up. We're going to be having some discussions in there. We're going to be having some case studies in there. We're also going to be having weekly live Q and A's to get all of your questions answered about this stuff. And I think that community part is actually just as important as just the content. Because let's be honest, a lot of this content, if you want to go searching for it everywhere on the internet, you're going to be able to find it somewhere. It's going to take you a while. And in fact, it took me, I don't know, months to years to do that. But really what's more important to me is figuring out how to kind of take those concepts 
really apply it and really kind of ingrain and learn, you know, as Cool. Did I lose you? Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Sorry, I had a call coming in there for a second. I had to turn it off. So we got a, <laughs> we got a few other questions coming in here. Um, another couple more from James Wax, actually. He's asking about leverage. Is there a certain percentage of leverage that you are comfortable with on those these deals? I mean, some syndicators use more than others. I've seen it anywhere from 20% down to 40% down. How much is too much leverage, do you think? Yeah, I think that ultimately depends. I mean, a lot of people use their leverage to ultimately reach the type of returns that they want. And you've got to be cautious and careful for that. And I think it's, I think the standard somewhere, once you start kind of hitting above uh, 70, 75% in terms of leverage, uh, in terms of loan of value is where people start getting a little bit nervous for these type of things. I mean, it also depends whether it's a debt deal or whether it's an equity deal. But I mean, those are the numbers that you start to kind of get a little bit worried about. And it's not just the type of leverage, but it's a type of financing that I really care about too, especially in this type of market. I mean, they might be leveraging a little more, but is this a long-term loan? I mean, is this, and I find that the more conservative um, syndicators these days are put locking in a little bit more of a longer fixed term loan, expecting that the mortgage, sorry, that the market will have a little bit of a correction here. You know, they don't want to be stuck in the same situation that a lot of people were stuck in in 2008. And so I care about that too. I care about what type of financing is in place beyond just the actual leverage number. Yeah. I hope that helps. Sure. And you have one other question about self-directed IRAs. Do you use yeah. a self-directed IRA to invest in these deals? Do you do it in a taxable account? Do you use a self-directed 401k? What do you use? I know all of my deals so far have been in taxable, um, but I've given some thought into using my fancy new self-directed 401k that I just got mm -hmm. this year maybe for some debt funds. I'm thinking about putting a debt fund in there, but um, thus far all mine have been taxable. Have you used a self-directed IRA or 401k at all for any of these? You know, I do the same thing as you. I set one up this year. I haven't used it yet. And the, the only thing I, the only type of fund that I would consider using it in is probably a debt fund as well, because it's just a little less tax efficient, the fund itself. And by at putting that under a self-directed IRA, that really kind of helps with that. Now, a lot of these equity deals, they're pretty tax efficient by itself. I mean, you're getting depreciation, cost segregation, which are kind of fancy terms, but that ultimately helps you kind of offset some of the gains that you have. And so kind of having it in a taxable account is kind of like the perfect situation. Um, and I want to take advantage of those to the fullest and to the max. So I'm Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't want the hassle of having an equity deal in a in a retirement account especially a self-directed ira you've got i can't remember what it stands for the ubti tax essentially you don't have yeah. to pay it in a 401k but you do in an ira and so i look at those and and i think they're great for debt funds i mean my debt funds are paying eight or ten or eleven percent and it's totally ordinary taxable income it's as tax inefficient as it gets i'm paying 42 yeah. percent taxes on that and so I, I've got some real motivation to move that into a 401k or IRA, but, but I, I'm content with the income from my equity deals being covered by the depreciation and, and being able to take long-term capital gains rates when it's eventually sold. So, uh, so B pool, I see your, I see your question there. What debt funds do you have in your IRA? I don't have any yet. They're all in taxable right now. And I think that's the same for Peter. Yeah. Um, so a question here from Mike Mullins. He's asking, you know, a, a question about the pro formas, right? The, all these deals put out a pro forma and they're, you know, they seem so, so specific. They're projecting this stuff out for five or seven or 10 years or whatever. He says the IRRs and ARVs and other future projections of the value of real estate seem so specific. How can they be so sure of about these values? I don't know my own home, a property I'm most familiar with will be in five years. Uh, especially after I fix up my kitchens and bathrooms. So what do you think about those numbers they use in the pro formas? How much faith should we put in them? Well, that's actually one of the things we look for when we look at a deal. We look at the pro forma and we look at the assumptions they make and make sure they're not outlandish. I mean, they have to make some assumptions, right? They need to give investors an idea of what their business plan, and it's a business plan. That's really what it is. Just like when any other, when any other business kind of creates their, you know, they want to start a restaurant. They want to get investors. They want to start this. They come up with a plan and they think this is probably the most likely thing will happen. 
and hopefully they're not being overly aggressive, you know, um, and they're being conservative. And these guys and hopefully these sponsors that you're looking at, they're trying to do the same thing. I mean, they have to come up with some sort of numbers based on their experience in the past. And honestly, it's just the best guess. But the ones that are really good will kind of actually give you a best guess based on very conservative numbers. And they're using comparables in that area, the way the market's been, based on their previous experience. I mean, there are certain numbers that they can kind of start to really understand, like kind of really get really specific on. Like if they, they're used to renovating a one bedroom apartment for X amount, you know, they use those same numbers all the time, right? Um, but in terms of what the appreciation will be in that area, the rent growth, and the market, these kind of things, you know, they have all these type of resources at their disposal to make the best guess. Now, one thing that I do suggest, and this is kind of a tip for people, is that when you actually are vetting a lot of these sponsors, if you can, ask for their track record, not just how well they've done, but see if they have a track record where they kind of are able to match up some of their previous projections against what they actually, what was, at, what was actual. And, you know, a lot of the good ones, they'll actually have this kind of information and they're willing to be transparent about it. And that's something you shouldn't feel shy about asking. If they don't have it readily available, that's fine. But maybe they will actually have, if it's not, if they don't have their overall track record, they should definitely have some case studies, um, some specific deals that they've done where they've kind of had the projected returns and what it ended up. And they'll probably show you the best ones, but at least they'll have some so you can kind of line up against what they've done. So uh, I don't know if that was helpful, but yeah, I, I think the, <laughs> yeah. the question, what I've found is with debt deals, they're pretty darn accurate. You know, with the debt deal, they can really give you a pretty good idea what your returns are going to be with the equity deals. I have yet to have a deal that followed its pro forma. Now, sometimes they, they did just fine in the end. I got the return I expected in the end. Um, more commonly in my experience, they've been a little bit below pro forma. I mean, all the incentive, is to make this deal look as good as possible to try to get investors into it, right? And so all their incentive, yes, they have a long-term incentive to keep things accurate. But for that specific deal, the incentive is really to get you into the deal. So you really gotta be careful there. I love the idea of asking them for their past record w compared to their pro formas. Uh, I asked uh, Origin Fund uh, for that information when I invested in it. And you know what? About half the time they beat it, about half the time they underperformed it, you know, and then some of the time they're right about on what they projected. It's just really hard to project. And so I think you got to realize that, that that is a little bit more of a, um, you know, art than science. Make sure the assumptions yeah. they're using seem reasonable to you, uh, but don't expect any of these deals to track along the pro forma. They're not going to. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, next question here. Um, this one was about, about you and your course, Peter. Why did you choose syndications for the subject for your <laughs> first course instead of some other aspect of real estate or passive income? Yeah, that's, I mean, first of all, I love all aspects of real estate. I do direct ownership. I've invested in notes. I've invested, uh, you know, in syndications and funds and these type of things. But the number one question that I got over and over again in my, you know, on my blog in our Facebook group was how do I vet a good syndication opportunity? That's it. I just got that question over and over and over again, because to be honest with you, I think a lot of physicians, they like the idea of real estate, but they don't want the hassle of being a landlord. They don't want to deal with that. They don't want another job in, in essence, you know, I mean, owning your own rental properties, to be honest with you, it's a business. Now there's great there's potential for great returns and I love it, but not everyone's like that because they just, they want to work. They want to come home. They don't want to think about it. And so, I think syndications and funds are a pretty attractive uh, option for people that want to get into real estate, but kind of have somebody else manage it. And so we got that question again and again and again. And honestly, I don't know. It took me a couple of years to finally get it. And I said, all right, finally, I'm going to put a resource together. And that's why I started with this one. Yeah, um, will sure. there be other it, ones in the future? Common Possibly. Question. Common question, yeah. but you can't answer it quickly, right? There's not, you can't just yeah. shoot them back <laughs> a quick email and say, here's how you do it. Right. It literally takes sitting down and walking them through stuff for hours. It's like putting together a financial exactly. plan. I can't tell you in one email how to put together a financial plan. You've got to, uh, you know, you've got to sit down with me for a few hours and put it together. And so that's why I put that together as my first course is this how you do a financial plan. Yeah. And it's the same way figuring out how to deal with these syndications. You can either do it like I did and get into a dozen or 15 deals, you know, invest the minimums and kind of, work your way through trying to learn how they work or you can take a course and have Peter spoon feed the information that took us, you know, a couple of years 
and some experience in these deals to, to really dig it out and put it together. But I don't think there's any doubt as to why these deals are attractive to doctors and other high income professionals, right? Number one, we're allowed into them. A lot of people aren't. These are, these are accredited investor only deals for the most part. If you don't have an income of $200,000 or $300,000 married and, a, and or a million dollars to invest, you can't get into these deals. And so that's one reason. The second reason is we're busy. We've already got a successful career. We don't need another career managing real estate. You know, I, I've got two jobs already. I don't need another one. And so I want my investments to be pretty <laughs> passive. I don't mind betting it up front, but I just want it to be mailbox money for the next two, three, five, seven years. And that's what a syndication yeah. or a real estate fund provides me is mailbox money. Now, the downside is it's not liquid. If you want to get out of this thing in, in three years and it's a seven year fund, you're not going to be able to do it very easily. And so you got to be prepared for that downside. But I think you're probably getting paid a little bit of a premium for being willing to be illiquid. Uh, and so I, yeah. I think they can play a role in your portfolio. I would not put you know 90% of your portfolio into these deals. I think that's a huge mistake. Um, but for some portion of your portfolio, I think it's very reasonable. So our next question here, for those who are just tuning in, I'm here with Peter Kim. He's the passive income MD. And we've been talking about his course that he's put together. There's a link in the comments to it. That's my affiliate link. If you buy the course while going through that, I will send you a signed copy of Financial Bootcamp as well. So that's the benefit of going through that link rather than going over to Peter's site and buying it directly from Peter. Uh, hey Jim, can I talk about the, <laughs> can I talk about the little, um, you know, we talked about this beforehand, but I, you know, for people that are tuning in, you know, I just want to say thank you. I mean, this is an exciting thing that we're kind of put together here. And we decided to kind of come up with a little bit of an, an extra incentive. I mean, Jim, your book is going to be amazing as an incentive. But what we decided to do for people who are willing to kind of sign on for this course and join the community, uh, I guess from now until the end of July 4th, so that's tomorrow evening or tomorrow at midnight, if you guys sign up for the course during this time, Jim and I are actually going to have another Q&A session about some of this stuff, about some real estate stuff or whatever. I think you're open to talking about whatever. But we're going to have a private session just for a few people that have signed up during this time. And if you've already signed up for the course, by the way, and a lot of you have, which has been amazing, um, you're going to be grandfathered into this as well. So don't worry about that. But we're going to come up with another time just to have a discussion amongst a small private group. And, uh, yeah, that'll be an incentive for if anybody's interested in being part of that. Yeah, sign up for the course by tomorrow uh, midnight. Cool. Huge, huge freebie he just threw out there. Uh, so you get that special, special session with us if you sign up by tomorrow at midnight. Um, if you don't want that and you want to wait as long as possible, this course is available through the ninth, right? Midnight, midnight Pacific yeah, time on night, the ninth. Midnight night. Last time you can sign up for it. Then it's not going to be open for months at least. And so this is not evergreen like fire your financial advisor. You know, my online course is evergreen. You can buy it any day you want. Sometimes we have a discount, like we have a discount on it right now. Um, but you can buy it any day you want. This course is not like that. You have to sign up by the ninth or you're not going to get a chance to buy it for months. All right, let's take our next question here. This one's about diversification. How do you diversify these things, Peter? Do you put 50,000 in one, 50,000 in another? Do you put 100,000 in one? I mean, how do you how do you address that? Yeah, I mean, I've talked about it in the past on my blog, but I'm a nut for diversification, almost probably to a fault. Uh, I like to get to know a lot of people, a lot of different sponsors, a lot of different type, different types of deals before I kind of fully commit a little bit deeper. And I feel like the only way to get to know people like this or the sponsors syndication, besides vetting them and taking that time, is actually do a deal with them and figure out what the, how they operate. How do they communicate? Do they actually, you know, under promise, over deliver, and these type of things. And so I actually like to put in small amounts of here, 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 here. But I found that for deals that have come full cycle, and I love the sponsor, or I kind of, you know, I've done well with them, honestly, the second time around, I'll go a little bit deeper. So I have invested in, man, I'm trying to think of the number here, but um, well into the double digits for different types of sponsors and types of funds, um, because I'm trying them out, to be honest with you. Not one is going to be perfect. And then different ones offer different types of things, geographic diversification. And so I'm, <laughs> hi guys. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not one of those that'll go, you know, 90 or hundred percent of whatever my funds is to one particular fund. I like to kind of spread my wealth. 
Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to how much money you have to invest. If your entire portfolio is four or $500,000, you know, $100,000 is a huge amount to put into one deal. So I wouldn't recommend you do that. On the other hand, if you're investing $10 million, well, $100,000 is only 1% of that. And so it's not as big of a deal there. Uh, when I was first getting started, not only did I not have nearly as much money to put into this stuff, but I was still testing things out. And I didn't really know how it was going to go. So I always put in the minimum. You know, a lot of times I was going through crowdfunded websites. And so the minimum was 2000 or 5000 or 10000 yeah. So I had all these two, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 deals. And then what I found from that <laughs> is they all paid me cash every month. And I had all these entries in my checking account. And I got a pain. It was a pain to keep track of them. You know, I got 15 people paying me every month. And uh, while well, it's fun to get, you know, cash flow like that. That's a good, that's a good problem to have. It, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a first world <laughs> problem for sure. But it was a pain to keep track of. And so now when I go into deals, they're much larger amounts. You know, they're, they're $100,000 at a time when I go into a deal. I just don't want to keep track of that many different syndicators, that many different deals. And so it just comes down to how much money you have to invest. You know, if you're only investing $20,000 a year into these sorts of investments, you're not going to be putting 100000 at a time into a deal. So it just depends on you, really. So uh, different strokes yeah. for different folks. But it's fine to, to, you know, wade in a little bit, dip your toe in in the beginning and see how these deals work. Let a couple of them go round trip. There's no rush. You know, you can you can wait five years before you put $100,000 into a single deal. It's really not that big of a deal. Um, you can certainly find deals for less. Hey, Jim, I got to cut it off here if that's OK. Yeah. My wife, uh, I got I got to take my wife to dinner. So yeah, she's been gracious enough to let me come on here. <laughs> it's too bad. We just yeah, we got 59 people in here watching this now. But oh, man, I'm so excited. But again, we can do this again. We can do a little private group for people that are interested in this. And then uh, let's make it happen. Let's do it. Let's do it. So those who are interested in Peter's new course, you can only sign up through next Tuesday night. Um, and the uh, URL is whitephoneinvestor.com slash syndication. If you sign up today or tomorrow, you can come to our special little session. Peter and I will do with you and answer your questions privately. Um, if you sign up through my links, you also get a copy of the Financial Bootcamp book. So sorry we didn't get to all the questions. We'll try to get to them uh, you know, next time. But at a certain point, we just got to cut it off. So thank you so much, Peter Kim, for coming on. And, uh, and we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks for the time, Jim. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Holiday.